Every family has its pivotal medical moments. Ours as a family, one of ours, was in July 1995 when my son Walker then was just 11 days old. He uh, d had difficulty taking his feedings. He couldn't hold anything down, and we took him to the pediatrician. The pediatrician put her stethoscope on his chest, listened for a moment, and then looked at us and said, there's something wrong with his heart. And we needed to take him to the hospital right away. I think there are millions of moments like this one that occur every day. A human being coming to another human being with their body or their mind's troubles and looking for their assistance. And that is the central act of medicine, that moment when another human being turns to another human being for help. And it always struck me how small and limited and, and improbable that moment is, that, that moment, the thought that any help could be offered. We have 13 different organ systems, and at latest count, we've identified more than 60,000 ways that they can go awry. The body is scarily intricate, unfathomable, hard to read. We are these hidden beings inside this fleshy sack of skin, and we've spent thousands of years trying to understand what's been going on inside. You open it up and it bleeds, it gets infected. We've spent an enormous amount of time, millennia really, tinkering largely ineffectively or worse along the way. So the story of medicine to me is the story of how we deal with the incompleteness of our knowledge and the fallibility of our skills. And that, to my surprise, became the basis of all of my writing and then research over what's been now almost two decades, and I couldn't be more grateful for the chance of this lecture to try to pull it all together into the themes that I think have come from some of it. There was an essay that I read two decades ago that um, I think has influenced almost every bit of writing and research I've done ever since, and it was by two philosophers, Samuel Gorovitz and Alistair McIntyre. They wrote an essay in 1976 on the nature of human fallibility. What they wondered was, why do human beings fail at anything that we set out to do? Why, for example, would a meteorologist fail to correctly predict where a hurricane was going to make landfall? Or why might a doctor fail to figure out what was going on inside my son and fix it? They said there are two primary reasons why we might fail. Number one is ignorance. We have only a limited understanding of all of the relevant physical laws and conditions that apply to any given problem or circumstance. The second reason, however, they called ineptitude, meaning that the knowledge exists, but an individual or a group of individuals fail to apply that knowledge correctly. Now, we've relied on science to overcome ignorance, and the course of that work has itself been incredibly fascinating. That pediatrician visit we made and everything that she did to sort out what was happening in my son could be traced back to 1628 and William Harvey when after millennia of pondering, he finally was the one who sorted out that the heart is a pump moving blood in a circular course through the body. That was when he figured it out, and therefore we figured it out. And then another critical step came not for three more centuries, not until 1929, when a surgical intern in Eberswald 
Germany made an observation. His name was Werner Forsman. And he was just reading some medical journals, um, an, an obscure one actually. It had animal studies, and it had the picture of a horse where they'd threaded a tube up the leg of the horse all the way into the heart, and then described what was going on from taking blood from there. And he said, well, if we could do that to a horse, what if we did that to a human being? And he went to his superiors, to his bosses, and said, how about we take a tube and thread it into a human being's heart? And they said, you're crazy. You can't do that. We know whenever you touch the heart, when people have attempted it in surgery, it goes into fibrillation and the patient dies. You cannot do this. And he said, well, what about in an animal? There's no point. And you're just an intern anyway. <laughs> Who th says you should even deserve to get to ask these questions? Go back to work. Well, he just had to know. And so what he did was he stole into the x-ray room, took a urinary catheter, made a slit in his own arm, threaded it up the vein and into his own heart and convinced a nurse to help him take a series of nine x-rays showing the tube inside his own heart. He was fired. <laughs> and then in 1956, he was awarded the Nobel Prize with Andre Cournand who took his findings some 20 years later at Columbia University and then recognized that you could not only put the catheter into a person's heart, but shoot dye into the heart. And that would let you take pictures and you could see the living heart and how it actually worked from the inside. What they'd done was they had founded the field of cardiology because now you could see inside the heart and understand how the valves worked and how the heart's function really operated and also what happens when it's not working. And then in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, one by one, we began devising techniques and ways to actually fix what was going on inside the heart. Science is concerned with universalities, universal truths, laws of how the body or the world behaves. Application, however, is concerned with the particularities. And the test is how the universalities apply to the particularities. Do the general ideas about the sounds the pediatrician heard in my son's chest do those general ideas correspond with the unique particularities of Walker? And here, Gorovitz and McIntyre saw a third possible kind of failure. Besides ignorance, besides ineptitude, they said that there is necessary fallibility. Some knowledge science can never deliver on. They went back to the example of how a given hurricane will behave, when it will make landfall, how fast it will be going when it does. And what they said is that we're asking science to do more than it can when we ask it to tell us just what exactly is going on. All hurricanes are ones that follow predictable laws of behavior, but no hurricane is like any other hurricane. Each one is unique. And a perfect understanding of a hurricane would require a perfect understanding of the myriad, even more complex factors going on around the hurricane in the entire environment. What's going on in the Gulf Stream? What's going on in the polar ice cap? We therefore cannot have perfect knowledge of our hurricane short of having a complete understanding of all the laws that describe natural processes and a complete state description of the world, they said. 
It required, in other words, omniscience. We can't have that. <laughs> so then the interesting question is, how do we cope? Now, it's not that it's impossible to predict anything. Some things are completely predictable, and they gave the example of a random ice cube in a fire. An ice cube is so simple and so like all the other ice, ice cubes that you can have complete assurance that you put it in the fire, it will melt. The everyday question for us, however, is are human beings more like hurricanes or are we more like ice cubes? So we take Walker to the emergency room here in town, in Boston. It's a Sunday morning. A nurse takes an oxygen monitor, one of those finger probes with the red light, and puts it on the finger of his right hand. And the oxygen level is 98%, virtually perfect. They get a chest x-ray. And the chest x-ray shows that the lungs are both whited out. They read it. They said, this is a pneumonia. They did a spinal tap to make sure that it wasn't signs of infection that had spread from a meningitis. They started him on antibiotics. And they called the pediatrician to let her know the, diagno di the diagnosis they'd, they'd found. It wasn't the heart, they said. It was the lungs, a pneumonia. And she said, no, that can't be true. And so she came into the emergency room, and she took one look at him, and he was having trouble breathing. He was not doing great. And she saw that the finger probe with the oxygen monitor was on the wrong finger. Now, it turns out there are certain conditions where the aorta can be interrupted. You can be born with an incomplete aorta. And so the blood flow can come out of the heart and go to the right side of the body and to the hand that had that probe, but it may not go to the left side of the body or anywhere else in the body. And that turned out to be what was going on. She switched the probe over to the left hand and he had an unreadable oxygen level. He was in fact, when we got the lab results back, going into kidney and liver failure from lack of blood flow to anywhere below the diaphragm. He was in serious trouble. And she had caught a failure to apply the knowledge we had to this given situation. And then the team made a prediction that in this situation, we do have a drug only invented, it turned out, only discovered in the, about a decade before my son was born. Prostaglandin E2, a little molecule that can reopen the fetal circulation. When you're a fetus in the womb, you have a bypass system that sends a separate set of blood supply that can stay open for a couple weeks after birth. It had shut down and that's why he went into failure. But this molecule can reopen that pathway. And the prediction was that this child was like every other child, that you could know what had happened to other children and could apply it here and that it would open up that fetal circulation, this bypass system. And it did. That gave him time to recover, to let his kidney and his liver recover, to let his gut start working again, and then to undergo a few days later, after he'd recovered in the intensive care unit, undergo cardiac surgery to replace his malformed aorta and to fix the holes that were present in his heart as well. They saved him. They saved him. There's, I think, in more and more ways, signs that we are as knowable as ice cubes. We understand with great precision how mothers can die in childbirth, how certain tumors behave, how the Ebola virus spreads, 
how the heart can go wrong and be fixed. We have many, many areas of continuing ignorance. Alzheimer's disease and what we can do about it, metastatic cancers, how we might make a vaccine against this virus we're dealing with now. But the story of our time, I think, has now become in a unique way as much a story about struggling with ineptitude as struggling with ignorance. You know, you go back just a few decades, go back a hundred years, and we lived in a world where our futures were governed largely by ignorance. But in this last century, we've come through an extraordinary explosion of discovery. And then the puzzle has become not only how we close the continuing gaps of ignorance open to us, but also how we ensure that the knowledge gets there, that the finger probe is on the right finger. In the ICU next to him was a child from Maine, about 200 miles away, who had virtually the same diagnosis that Walker had. And when he was diagnosed, it was too long before the problem was recognized. Transportation could be arranged, and he could get that drug to give him back that open circulation. And the result was that poor child with the same condition my, my son had in that very next bed to us had gone into complete liver and kidney failure. And his only chance while we were waiting there was that he was waiting for an organ transplant to give him some chance at a future that was going to be very different from what my son had gotten to have. And then I think back on my family. My father comes from a rural village in India, my mother from a big city in the north of India. And if Walker had been anything like my 37 nieces and nephews in the rural village where my family still has our farm, we're still farmers raising wheat, a kind of wheat and sugarcane and cotton. And if he'd been there, there'd have been no chance at all. There's a misconception, I think, about global health. We think global health is about care in just the poorest parts of the world. But the way I think about global health, it's about the idea of making care better everywhere. The idea that we are trying to deploy the capabilities that we have discovered over the last century, town by town, to every person alive. We've had an extraordinary transformation around the world. Economically, even with the last recession, we've had the rising of the global economies on every continent. And the result has been a dramatic change in the length of lives all across the world. We've shifted to a world where we've gone from respiratory illness and malnutrition being the biggest killers in the world, to one where it's now cardiovascular disease, to where road traffic accidents are a top five killer and cancers are in the top ten. And that with that economic progress has come the knowledge that solutions exist. My family in our village in India know, they know that solutions exist to the problems that we have. And so the puzzle is how we deploy that capability everywhere. In India, in Maine, across the UK, Europe, Latin America, the world. And we're only just discovering the patterns of how we might begin to do that. The striking thing is that there is enormous variation. There is a bell curve in the results you're likely to get for any given condition, depending on where you are in the world. There is enormous variation, that bell curve, between countries. But the variation is actually bigger within countries, within India, within the United States, within UK and Europe, 
everywhere, you can see from the bottom to the top and everything in between. Now, variation is incredibly interesting to me, and I think that has been the case for a long time, and I think it may come from the seeds that became the person who is a writer now or a, and a researcher. Variation to me is gold. <laughs> the common faith of both science and writing is that there is a power to observation and understanding variation. And there is an importance to transparency about the variation that exists in the world. A hundred years ago, we couldn't see inside our hearts until Forsman and Cournand could show us what happens inside and let you see the variation that happened. Today, we can't see inside our systems. We can't see inside our clinics and our emergency rooms and our operating rooms. We're um, just starting to open those doors. And I think what happened for me just about 20 years ago now was that I got to rediscover the art of, almost the lost art, of the simple case study that had been such a powerful tool in the 19th century and before in medicine. The simple observation of the detailed case. But I read Oliver Sacks when I was a medical student. And seeing his description of the man who mistook his wife for a hat and these many other detailed case studies made me think that this was something that perhaps I could do. Only I turned it onto observation of the system surrounding the body more than the body. One of my first articles um, for the New Yorker magazine was an article about a mistake that I had made that nearly killed a patient and mistakes that I'd observed colleagues to make in my own hospital. And from that came, now it's nearly 100 articles and investigations for the New Yorker and other magazines and, and four books. I investigated the most expensive town for healthcare in the world. I'd investigated the learning curve and how we have to learn in medicine and practice upon people. Most recently, I looked at what happens as we've turned aging and the end of our lives into a medical experience, what really happens when that has occurred. And I've had a chance to extend these ideas to research as well. One of the earliest studies that our team did was a study of medical records from uh, 15,000 patients at hospitals in the middle part of the United States. We were looking at all of the cases where people came into the hospital and they either died or ended up severely disabled when they left. They had a complication of care. And what we found was a third of the time the complication seemed to be because of ignorance. We just didn't have all the knowledge to know what to do to avoid certain kinds of risks and circumstances. But two-thirds of the time, they were due to avoidable error, due to what Gorvitz and McIntyre would have labeled ineptitude. And then there's been a explosion of ways that we are able to investigate further. Colleagues of mine have done studies where they've sent mystery shoppers, so to speak, fake patients who could act um, and turn up at doctor's offices with the exact symptoms of tuberculosis or cholera and deployed them in Asia and Latin America and found that two-thirds of the time, we don't even recognize the diagnosis that we're coming in and bringing in front of them. We've bought audio tape, videotapes, being able to unfold and create an incredible potential of flowering where we can ask, why do our systems fail? Why are, are these different components not working the way we want? How could we make them better? And also, by the way, start to discover what can't be improved, what, where the necessary fallibility is. In the coming lectures, I'm hoping to be able to unpack three ideas. First is what we're learning from opening the door, from seeing behind the curtains of medicine and, and, and health, and discovering what, how much can be done that saves lives and reduces suffering. 
Number two is having a chance to look at the reality of our necessary fallibility and how we cope effectively with the fact that our knowledge is always limited. And then number three is the chance to look at the implications of both of these, what we're learning about our ineptitude and about our necessary fallibility and what they mean for the global future of medicine. Now, it is uncomfortable looking inside our fallibility. We have a fear of looking. The, um, the place we've come to is that uh, we're like the doctors who dug up the bodies in the 19th century in order to dissect them, in order to know what was really happening inside. When we looked inside the bodies, or we look inside our systems and how they really work, they're messier than we knew, and sometimes messier than we might have wanted to know. In some ways, I think, you know, turning on the cameras inside our world is more treacherous at times. There's a reason that Gorvitz and McIntyre labeled the kind of failures we have ineptitude. There's a sense that there's some shame or guilt to the fact that we don't get it right all the time. And exposing it can make people more angry than exposing the fact that we're simply ignorant about certain ideas. And therefore, we've blocked many of these efforts to try to provide some transparency to what's going on. The audio tapes are often not allowed. The video recorders are turned off. We have no black box for what happens in our operating rooms or in our clinics. The data, when we have it, is often locked up. You can't know, even though we have the information, which hospitals have a better complication rate in certain kinds of operations than others. There's a fear of misuse, a fear of injustice in doing it, in exposing it. But arguably, there are lives at stake from not opening up the doors. And I think we also will miss out on the chance that what we get to find can often be miraculous. Walker, they told us when he went home, Walker was going to need a second operation. The repair that he'd had was one that replaced the tube, uh, the aorta, the tube coming out of his heart to carry blood supply throughout the rest of the body. And that tube had been replaced, but in an 11-day-old child, it was, a, it was almost like a straw. Now, they had put it in in such a way that it could grow a little bit. It could expand as he grew, but it was not going to accommodate an adult-sized body. And so they told us he would have to, when he became a teenager, you know, get a new replacement aorta, and that it would be a risky thing he would have to undergo. And being a surgery resident, I knew what that entailed. It was a 5% chance of death and a 25% chance of paralysis, and we lived in some fear about when that moment would come. But when it came, when he was 14 years old, the world had changed. And that by then, technology had developed to allow the aorta to be expanded with a simple catheter. We found the expert who had learned and even devised some of the methods for being able to do that right here in Boston. He explained to me, you know, cardiologist to surgeon, just how it's done, and sometimes you learn stuff you don't necessarily want to know. He talked about the idea that, you know, you have to apply pressure to a balloon that would be threaded up into the aorta. And you know what? He, he can really feel the vessel tearing and that the trick is to tear it just enough that it can expand, but not so much that it ruptures. There was a necessary fallibility to what he was going to do. But he knew how to do it. He knew what the feel was. And Walker ended up getting through that procedure just fine. The extraordinary thing was the very next day, he, um, he went home. And the day after that, he was well enough to play sports and injure his ankle on the playing field. <laughs> this June, he graduated from high school 
And this fall, he entered college. He's going to live a long and normal life, which is amazing. And the key question we have to ask ourselves is how are we going to make it possible for others to have that? How do we fulfill our duty to make it possible for others? And the only way I can see is by removing the veil around what happens in that procedure room, in that clinic, in that office or that hospital. Only by making what has been invisible, visible. This is why I write. This is why we do the science we do. Because this is how we understand. And that, to me, is the key to the future of medicine. Thank you.